Good morning, everyone. Come on in from that lobby. I know you're having a great job, great time out there talking. No talking and having fellowship here at church. Actually, we love talking and fellowship. Why don't you look right down the road to somebody and say good morning. Good morning. Song. You've been walking the same old road for miles and miles. You've been hearing the same old voice telling the same old lies. If you're trying to fill the same old holes inside, there's a better life. There's a better life. Come on, sing it with me. If you've got a pain, he's a pain taker. Shaking Savior, you got James, he's a chain breaker. have a seat there. Hey, we slowed that one way down for y'all because it's just that kind of a morning. Everybody feel like it just needs to be chill this morning. Maybe it's the, the weather outside. We usually PD's in, in gear number five, drinking five cups of coffee. I'm only on cup number four today. And so we're just, we're just chilling a little bit. We're glad you're here. We're glad the kids are walking in. Everybody look to the back over this way and say, hey, kids. Oh, nothing like putting the kids on the spot and making them nervous. Good to have them. We're going to do a, a preemptive fireside chat. So those that go to Oakwood know when you see the fire on the screen and PD's sitting in a chair, that means it's fireside chat. I don't have a chair. I don't got time. But we're going to just do a quick fireside chat today. Phil, I'm going to switch over to my headset mic. And I want to show you this because... Uh, uh, boy, this morning on the way into church, I was, I was so impressed. I was driving through the neighborhood, and I'm seeing all the signs for the Billy Graham, the Franklin Graham, God Loves You Tour Crusade. I've seen signs in people's, and every time I saw a sign, I looked, and it's like, oh, that's one of Oakwood's people. And I realized, 
It's just us, people. I don't think any of the churches are doing this in town, not that I know of. So you're doing a great job of getting the signs up. And then I got to the church, and whoever mows our grass took our signs and put them on the grass. And they didn't put them back in the... So we sent some teens out. Where are my teens that helped me out? They put the signs back in. Thank you very much. Oh, it's good to have some teen helpers. But I wanted to point this out today as we're getting ready for this. It's September 29th is the big outreach. Has anybody been following the prayer guide? Julie and I, at every dinner, we go through that day's prayer guide. And sometimes it's very short. It's just a verse and a thought. We've been praying for volunteers this week. We've been praying for pastors and churches. We've been praying for the, there is an online uh, how to share the gospel course that you can take really short. I'd encourage you to be looking up those things. Go to the GodLovesYouTour.com and uh, look it up. Uh, you can take that little course and be prepared to share the gospel. Uh, but it's coming. It's coming soon. And so it's time for this. We're really going to push this next week, but these little bookmarks are all at the uh, cafe, and the bookmark on the back has a bunch of lines for you to write the names of people. Now, friends, I'm going to tell you, most people won't do this step because it's a little bit of accountability when you list a name that you want them to know Jesus as their Savior, and you put it on paper, all of a sudden it makes you feel like, hmm, maybe I ought to invite them to this. Exactly. That's what we want you to do. I'm challenging you to do. I'm going to put it on my shoulder. Double dog dare you. Is that how they're supposed to do it? You know what? A triple dog. I'll go straight to a triple dog there that you grab one of these bookmarks, start writing the names of family, friends, co-workers, neighbors that you would like them to know Jesus Christ and then start praying for them. But it's also your accountability to make that invitation that they come with you. Start doing this now. Start praying ahead now the whole month of September that will be prepared on September 29th. Now, how many of you were able to come out to worship in the park last Sunday? Thank you so much. She's going to run some pictures. We'll just let the pictures run. What a beautiful night. Amen? Amen. Isn't it great that the right call was made to postpone it for one week? Everybody say amen. Amen. It was the right call. Really, it was. It was a beautiful day last week. Uh, but I did see the lightning and a little bit of rain hitting the windshield. So I'm thankful we waited a week and were able to have it this week. If it messed you up, I'm sorry. Uh, but maybe it helped others come to worship in the park and enjoy it. But again, we had uh, quite a few people came out. And uh, the, the, the night was gorgeous and the spirit was great. The snow cones were great. How many had a great snow cone? Thank you, Mr. Jeff Moore and the Moore family. Always great to have a little treat out in the summer. And then uh, I thank so much to all the volunteers it takes. All the people who, who helped us take all the equipment, load it, unload it, set it up, put it back in, bring it here, get it back in the spots. Uh, everybody that, that worked very hard on that, we thank. So, and then uh, it was... Uh, uh, Thomas Knopf that took the pictures for us. Thank you, Thomas. Let's thank him. Took pictures and got them to us. That's just a, a selection of them. I'm going to invite Pastor Ben to come on up and give us our, our normal welcome and greeting this morning. Did we have a slide for the remembrance walk as well? There we go. And you see my shirt. I told you I was going to wear it. So that is the last thing we want to make sure you guys are aware of is happening. We want to invite you guys to be a part of that. Uh, that is a remembrance walk for the Stand Strength team uh, and Dr. Terry Nally. And so just uh, make sure that you mark that on your calendar because we'd love for you to be a part of that as well. Uh, welcome, church. Uh, do you know what I'm welcoming you to? No, football season. Oh. Yes. We are so... Hey, yeah, well, you know, okay. hey, Michigan State beat a very good western team and michigan beat like what was that colorado elementary school what was that yeah, 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 yeah. what was that beth it's okay hey <laughs> we'll see you later this uh next month it's okay uh yeah hey welcome to football season but more importantly welcome to church we are so excited that you're here with us on labor day uh well labor day weekend how many of you are going camping later today no all right we're all working later today yes no okay all right uh, but we're thankful that you're here with us. My name is Pastor Ben. If it is not abundantly clear, I am the youth pastor here. Uh, this is Petey. He is our lead pastor. Uh, and we're just thankful that you're here with us. If you would, uh, just take some time and pray with us. Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have to be here this morning. We thank you for each and every one of the people that are here. Father, we just pray for all those who are traveling this weekend that they would just be uh, safe and would be healthy on their travels. And Father, uh, as we gather as a church, we just invite you into this place. 
Uh, we invite you to be here with us. We invite you to open our heart in a new way this morning. So, Father, we just ask that you would do that. Father, we love you and we thank you. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Stand with us as we sing. We worship the God who loves. We worship the God who lives. We worship the God who ever will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, He holds the victory. Come on. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we will be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we will be quiet. We shout out your praise. Oh, oh, oh. We shout out your praise. The God who heals. We sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always Cause He hung up on that cross and He rose from the grave. My God still rolling stones away. Yeah, I believe it. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today.
earth shall soon the earth shall soon dissolve like snow the sun forbear to seated. Thank you, team. Sorry about that. We were ready for everything, then the string broke. What was that all about? Sorry. forgot to remind you of this is our last of our summer schedule today 10 o'clock next week we begin 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock so just so you're aware of that 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock it'll be great for our children's ministries workers we've been missing them uh, Jeff Moore who is here with the kids uh, this morning he does that every Sunday and so he has not been in church all summer I keep telling him as an elder he's a delinquent heathen so uh, but he what he does he watches and it's nice that we have the ability to watch things later and so uh, but it's just not the same so just remember that nine o'clock and eleven o'clock 11 o'clock is the only service where we have children's ministries. So if you have children and want them to be involved, you need to come to the 11 o'clock service. But 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock, spread the word. Uh, we have plenty of room, room to grow. That's what we like. We like to have room to grow. So continue to come back. Let's pray this morning as we get into the discussion in Romans. Let's pray together. Would you pray this prayer? to prepare your hearts just silently in your heart just say God since there's something you want me to hear I'm willing to listen God since there's something you want me to hear I'm willing to listen and God we pray that you would be glorified pray that everyone hearing this message either today or during the week they'd be edified and I pray that Satan would be horrified we pray in Jesus name amen Romans this is the last of our series for now we're going to take a four-week break and go through the book of Nahum you you wouldn't believe all the questions I've got since I announced that we are preaching through Nahum uh, people saying are you really gonna preach through the book of Nahum there's nothing in that book it's terrible it's an awful book Nahum is a, it's actually a very good book because it's a follow-up from Jonah everybody remember the story of Jonah and Nineveh remember that whole story well this is a hundred years after Jonah went in as a reluctant prophet and he declared the Lord's judgment upon the city unless they repented, and they repented. You remember that? It was kind of a great ending to a terrible story. The world's worst missionary, you know. He didn't want to go. He ran from God. He eventually went, and then he went in only a quarter of the way of the city, and he's like, repent or die. That was his whole message, like that's going to do any good. And they all repented. If I remember correct, the king repented, the people repented, and the cows repented. Look it up. I mean, the whole nation repented. And, and 
it was great. And a hundred years later, not so much. And Nahum is the book of a just God. And that's why we're calling it just love. A just love. Yes, it's a book of God's condemnation. But for us as believers, it's good to know that God is a God of what He says. He is a God of mercy and patience, but He's also a God of justice. And that is part of His love. And so we'll start that next week, four weeks of Nahum, just love. Last time we were together, uh, we, we, had, we heard Heidi's story. Thank you again, Heidi. You did a, such a wonderful job last Sunday. Um, the week before that, we were in Romans 5. So if you can remember, Romans 5, 1 through 5 was about the power of faith, not works, not lineage, not nothing. Everybody say, not nothing. There's not nothing that can get you saved but God. But God. And so we learn about the power of that faith. And now we're into Romans 5, 6 through 21. So turn there. Meet me in Romans 5 at about verse 6. We'll read this and then we'll make some points today and we on the road. Romans 5, 6 through 21. I'll read it. You follow along. You see, at just the right time, we were still powerless. Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, but for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from the wrath, God's wrath, through him? For if, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to Him through the death of His Son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through His life? Have you been noticing the... (laughs) You're watching the punctuations, right? I was going to do that, but I didn't. In your mind, you should be doing that because you know PD does that. There's an exclamation point there. He is shouting these thoughts. (laughs) Verse 11. Not only is this so... But we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, in this way death came to all people because all sinned. You see that? You got a little in your Bible? Do you see that? This is important because the theologians have been arguing for centuries what happens next. See, Paul is a, is, a, is a writer and a thinker, and he wrote this wonderful line, and then he got done writing it and thought, I better explain this some more. So you got a whoosh, all right? And then a little whoosh, a bracket. Verse 13, he's going to explain what he just said. To be sure, sin was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not charged against anyone's account where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as as did Adam, who is the pattern of the one to come. But the gift is not like the trespass, for if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to many? Nor can the gift of God be compared with the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespass of the one man death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in the life of one man, Jesus Christ? End of bracket. Sure cleared things up to me. Paul's the master of making a very hard statement than really making it a lot more difficult, okay? So everything we saw since the bracket, or the, the line, and then the bracket, is clarifying the one sentence. Now we pick it back up in verse 18. Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. For just as through the disobedience of one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. 
The law was brought in so that the trespass might increase. But where sin increased, grace increased all the more. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through the righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Whew. Paul, Paul, Paul. Let's break him down verse by verse and try to understand what he was getting at this morning. It's all about comparisons and contrast. If you want to know what Paul's trying to get at here, he's trying to compare Adam's sin and what that did to the world to Jesus Christ and his death on the cross and what that means to the world. And he's doing this by comparison and contrast. You guys know comparison and contrast. I wrote down a few this week. This is a big one in my family. Coke versus Pepsi. How many of you, when you go into a restaurant, say, uh, do you have Coke or Pepsi? And then the waitress says, we have Pepsi. Is that all right? You know what to say next, right? Yes. No, that's not all right. <laughs> because we order Diet Coke with a slice of lime everywhere we go. And if they have Pepsi, it's water. I, I don't know. I mean, yeah, we're just picky like that. Coke versus Pepsi. Now, see, what's happening here is I'm going to set you up because we're all going to be disagreeing about these comparison and contrast, right? So let's talk about some more. Ford versus Chevy. See, now I knew you got, you're, who said we were voting today? All right, look at everybody. Okay, all right, if you want to vote, because I know you want to vote. If, it, it, if, if you agree with the first thing I said, you're going to point to the left, okay? Or, no, wait, you're right. Point to the right. Stage left, right. Uh, if, you, if you like the second thing I say, you point to the left, which is stage right. Are we confused yet? All right, all right, here we go. Let's try it again. Ford versus Chevy. Okay, all right. How about this one? A city versus country. Okay, interesting. All right, good, good. How about U of M versus MSU? Yeah. Ben, did you, you're not voting? You're not sure? Ben, Ben's been standing up. He's doing the double point lean. He, he loves his, his U of M. All right, how about um, Mac versus PC? Oh, see now that, I love that one because there's some really quick people on that one. How about the same kind of vein, Apple versus Android? Hmm, yeah, okay, all right. So, some of y'all are pointing up. I mean, what happened? What? <laughs> some of you are like, I once was Apple, now I'm Android, and praise Jesus. I don't know what you're doing. What's that? What's that? What? I don't know what that is. How about the beach versus the mountains? That's a tough one. I like both of those. How about Backstreet Boys versus NSYNC? Anybody remember that? Anybody? You know, the kids are looking at me like, what's a, what's a, what a, what a, what a, what a, what a? Remember that? You got to remember that one. How about um, warm versus cold? Where's my winter people? They're in the fall? Fall? Sweatshirts and, and bonfires? Yeah. All right, how about the uh, sweet versus sour? Sweet versus sour. Yeah. No, wait, I just saw, I'm not so sure, but, but I think Brenda just pointed at Stan when I said sour. I don't think that was the, that wasn't the vote, Brenda. That wasn't the vote. That wasn't the vote. Okay, this one I just know. I just everybody just go ahead and point this way. Just everybody point this way. Chicago deep dish versus, there's no competition on that. It's over. <laughs> Chicago deep dish. So that's what Paul is kind of doing here. He's setting up this compare and contrast. And when we start looking at this again, I want you to pay attention specifically to the words. And if, I were, if you're a, a writing your Bible type person or a highlighter person, when he says so, everybody say so. so. You should circle that. No, not so. As. Everybody say as. Yes. You should circle it as because that's when he's going to say the first thing as coke and then he says some things and then he says so also pepsi it's always an as blank so also blank if you see the as and the so also's you'll understand exactly what he's trying to say there's a lot of words and paul can confuse people i don't know what english major could could kind of uh, you do this in english what do you do those uh, you, what do you what's that called yeah, diagram. Can you imagine diagramming Paul? He's so hard because he says so many words, right? So it's as blank, so also blank. And there's your comparison contrast, okay? So you can kind of pick up what he's doing there. So let's go back. Verses 6 through 8 is one section. 
In verses 6 through 8, he's just getting the ball rolling here. He's like, we are powerless. Nothing we can do saves ourselves. Why would anyone die for anyone else? Nobody does that. Only love does that. Only love dies for someone. And the beautiful comparison contrast there is a sinner versus a righteous person. And, and the Bible even says, I mean, for a righteous person, no one's going to die. Maybe for a good person, right? Don't you remember when Jesus was called, hey, good teacher? Remember that? When the man came to him and called him, hey, good teacher. And what was Jesus' first question? Why do you call me good? We know from Paul's teaching that no one is good, right? So Jesus was trying to get him to understand, you've actually named me correctly. You've called me by the right name because I am good. I have never sinned. There's nothing sinful in me. I am righteousness. So that the name was correct, but Jesus wanted to know, why are you calling me that? See, he didn't actually have it right because he didn't end up getting saved in that story, right? Remember that whole thing where Jesus had to, to talk to this man specifically and he was not ready to receive faith? Why do you call me good? The, so the, here Paul is saying, for a good person, someone might die. The only good person who's ever walked on the planet is Jesus Christ, sinless. But he didn't, he didn't get rescued by anyone. No one died for Jesus. He died for us. There's your comparison contrast. And we're not good. We're not righteous. We're sinners. That's why Paul made the point. Someone might die for a righteous, somebody might die for a good person, but God sent Jesus who died for you while we were sinners. That's, that is the definition of love, friends. That's the definition of what love is. And then you have the, one of the most famous verses in Romans, but God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. It's God's demonstration of who he is. He's love. Then verse 9 through 11, God chose love over condemnation. If God chose to forgive us in our sinfulness, God chooses to love us in our justification. Thank Jesus. I love how Paul does that. He makes the point that, that God died for you while you were in your sinfulness. But now that you've been justified, remember the judge slams his gavel down and he makes a declaration. God has declared you righteous and pure. The moment you go to him and say, God, please save me of my sin. Come into my life as Savior and Lord. He slams the gavel down. He calls you righteous and pure. Not that you are pure. He declares you that based on Jesus. Everybody say Jesus. He declares you that upon Jesus. Then Paul says, if God loved you in your sinfulness, how much more are you, are you loved in the righteousness of Christ? You've been declared. And then he, he goes into this talk about enemies versus friends. We were enemies of God, and now we've been called friends. How powerful is that? Now verse 12. Here's where we get to it. Therefore, is a key thought. As, everybody say as. Here's the blank there. Sin. As sin, which brought death to everyone, so entered the world through one man, Adam. But then I want you to notice something in verse 12. This is Paul, classic Paul. He started the as. You can't find the so also. Look, look, look at verse 12. That's because he finished his thought about the as blank. And he decided to go back and explain that some more. That's why we've got the the little line. Look in your Bibles. There's a little line there after verse 12. Now here's what the theologians have argued about. Where does he end explaining that? In some of your, vice, in some of your translations, you've got little, little brackets. Where is your second bracket? The first bracket always starts at verse 13. Somebody tell me, where's your second bracket at? What? 17. Does anybody have one after 14? Different versions put the brackets in different places. Now here's a quick moment, eyeballs here. Let me explain something. When the Bible was written, it did not have chapter titles and verse numbers. That came later, much, much later. And God bless the people who did that. I'm sure they're way smarter than me. But why they made some of the choices, I don't know. They really put some breaks at weird places. 
And by the way, Paul, when he wrote this, he didn't have brackets or that little line. These are just ways that we're trying to make sense of how he wrote. He just wrote words. And then later on, they came and they put these things in there. And the verse, chapters, titles, and the verse. Now listen, they're not God-ordained, the numbers there. That's not God's word, the verse numbers, okay? But I'm thankful they're there. Aren't you glad I didn't say everybody turn to Romans and go about 28 paragraphs to the right and a half of a thought down to the bottom? I mean, it's so easy to say turn to Romans 5, verse 6. Thank you. I'm thankful for the people who did the numbering. But it, it is not ordained by God. It's just helpful. So when we get to this section, what I'm telling you is different men over time have taken Paul's thought here and put the bracket at 13 and ended it at 14. But I believe the proper place for these brackets to be are at the beginning of 13 at the end of 17. He's got four verses of explaining one verse crammed into one. And you'll notice then when you get to 18, he starts over with the as. See verse 18, consequently, in other words, I just finished explaining all this, so consequently, just as, so also. You'll see it happen there like three or four more times on the rest of the way out. Are you with me? I know you guys are like, you're geeking out. I told you, I geek out a little bit at the first part of the sermon, then we'll give you the points later, you'll be fine. So let's go back to 12. The key thought is sin. Sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin. And in that way, death came to all people because all have sinned. So now Paul's thinking, oh, I just mentioned that one man. I better explain Adam. Adam is that one man. And in here, Paul says Adam was a type of Christ. He, he, he is kind of one that comes later, in, in a sense, comparison and contrast. Adam, Christ. You, you, you did see the big idea for today, right? The big idea for today's message is, as in Adam, so in Christ. I tried to follow Paul. As so, as in Adam, so also in Christ. Paul's trying to, to really give us a, a big, a huge theological understanding here, friends. And today I pray you take this and understand it. And you internalize it in a way that you can explain it to others. Because what we're talking about has gospel ramifications. Because so many people get hung up here. So many people are like, wait a second, wait a second. You're telling me I was born with a sin problem, right? I believe that's true. Well, how come? Well, because your daddy was a sinner and your grandpa was a sinner and your great grandpa, all the way back to Adam. It all started with Adam. Adam was a type of a representative of all humanity and people get hung up here. People are like, that's not fair. I don't want Adam to represent me because <laughs> he blew it. Well, again, when you get to heaven, find him, kick him in the shin. Then stick around because he's going he to kick you in the shin and say you'd have done the same thing. Adam's sin brought the punishment and consequences of sin to all humanity, but you and I have kept sin in the world. I need to say that again. So look, we can't just say this is all Adam's fault and thank Jesus I'm the innocent victim in this whole thing. No. No, it started with Adam. He was a representative of all humanity. When he chose sin, death by sin, from there, anybody who was born from them, from Adam, was born a sinner. By the way, Jesus Christ was not born of Adam's seed, remember? He was born of the woman. God bore Jesus through Mary. So Jesus didn't come from the line of Adam. He's both human and divine. If he had come from Adam, he would have had the same sin problem you and I were born with. So you can start to see the compare and contrast. Adam brought sin. We've kept it here. Again, I don't have a hard time. Some of you might still go home with a hard time on this. You have indigestion. I, I'm sorry. I, I can't. I can't fathom it any other way because I'm telling you, babies are really cute, but they are selfish. Babies are absolutely 100% needy and self-centered. I've never seen a two-week-old, and Ben, you can say shout amen here at any time, Ben. I've never seen a two-week-old say, you know, mom and dad, I'm going to just sleep through the night tonight because it looks like you need a break. 
<laughs> a two-week-old does not have the moral fortitude of saying, I, I only care about you, mom and dad, so I'm going to forego eating and pooping for 24 hours. No. No, babies are 100% needy and 100% selfish. That's how we're born. We have to discipline and train children out of that selfishness. Again, let's take it to six-month-old. Six-month-old, still very focused on their needs. They might start understanding there are the human beings and if I show love, it's a great thing. But all in all, I still want food when I want it. And when I make a mess, you better clean it up. Take that to two-year-olds. Again, you need to understand, I worked in the nursery one time. I was a teenager. They sent me into the nursery. I walked in, started playing. A kid picked up a train, threw it at my head. I said, I'm going to be the pastor so I never have to work in there again. That's what set me on the path that I am today. Children. I love them and we need you. And you guys who love children and work in the nursery, we need you. You do an incredible thing. But children are selfish and they have to be trained and disciplined out of that selfishness because we're born with that bent. I just have no problem seeing that. And it comes from Adam and it came down through my great grandpa and then grandpa and then my dad and then me and I've passed it on to my children. From Adam, sin came. But we kept it there. Each person in this room chooses sin. No one has chosen and, and been able to be perfect. We're sinful. The Bible makes that very clear. Go ahead and let's throw those two verses up. I know it's not time, Cass, but I'm going to ask for them now. Romans 3.10. I think it was the first one. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. Very clear. Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now you tell me, what does all mean? All means all. That's all all means. For all have sinned. The Bible is very clear on this point. But people get hung up on this. That's why I'm telling you, Romans 5, 6-21 is Paul's beautiful explanation of where sin came from and what God did about it. As Adam, so in Christ. Adam was a representative of humankind, and then later came Jesus, who also became a representative. He died on our behalf. You're like, you're like, no, I don't want one man's sin to be my problem. Yes, but you do need one man's perfection and death to be your reconciliation. Amen? We're only saved through a representation. We can't do it for ourselves. We needed the one man, Jesus Christ, because there was one man whose name was Adam. Do you see how important this is today? And so he's making the comparison. That's why he stopped at verse 12. And he said, I better talk some more about this. And then he goes on forever. And he, he talks about uh, sin. He's like, yeah, well, wait a second. The law came from Moses. What about those sins from Adam to Moses? And he's like, well, you know, there is nothing against your account if there wasn't a law. But yet there were sinful men. People died before the law was written. And that's why it's called trespass. It's still sin. Let me just explain it like this. Has anybody ever got pulled over and you thought you were in a 45 and you were doing 50, but you were in a 35 going 50? Anybody ever get that kind of scenario? And you're like, oh, I was only five off. They're like, no, you weren't. You were 15 off. But I thought, I thought I was only five off. Now, that is not the explanation of sin before Moses. Because before Moses came, people were going 90 through a 25 mile an hour neighborhood. That's what was happening. And you're like, what? But there was no speed signs. There was no, yeah. But you know driving 90 through a neighborhood is bad and wrong. How many of you know that even if there's not a sign posted? If you drive through a neighborhood and you got kids on go-karts and b little mini bikes and their children playing basketball and you're booking 90 through that neighborhood, you know you're doing wrong, amen? You're doing wrong. And if you get pulled over, you're not going to say, but I didn't, I didn't see a sign. You don't need a sign. You're going to jail <laughs> and we're taking your keys. And you're going to give your car away to, to repo cast, to be, to, uh, you know. That's what's happening before Moses. When Moses wrote the law, then it became extremely clear. Yes, I was going 50 in a 35. It's, I understand the law makes sin even more guilty. You see it, you know it, I definitely broke it. 
But before that, it doesn't mean that Adam didn't know any better. No, he, God said don't do it. He did it. It's sin. It's sin. So sin from Adam all the way to Moses was sin. And then the law came in and then they knew their sinfulness and even felt more guilt because of the law. That's all, God, that's all the law does. It shows you your guilt. That's why we need Jesus. Are you with me this morning? So here we go. We, we talk about that. The gift. Now he starts comparing and contrasting Jesus with the si- Jesus and Adam. Adam and Jesus. The sinful and the, non- the obedient versus the disobedient. We get to verse 18, and this is where we get the as. Let me just break them down. In verse 18, as one sin act, so also one righteous act. Verse 19, as disobedience of one, so also obedience of one. And then I love verse 20. My sins, they are many. His mercy is more. That's where we get that song. My sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. Remember that song? My sins they are many, His mercy is more. And then he goes one more round in verse 21. As sin reigned in death, so also grace reigns through righteousness. What's the result? Eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. There you have it. That's the verse by verse explanation. Let's put it on PowerPoint. Wouldn't you have liked it if Paul used PowerPoint? Could have clarified his thoughts. Story of comparisons. Verse 12. There's sin and sickness. Sin is universal. Why? One man. The representative of humankind, Adam. Sin is universal. Because of that sin, it brought sickness, which is death. Death is universal. What do we know is true? Death and taxes, amen? We got death and taxes, all those things. And we know that that those things are universal. Sin is universal, and because Adam sinned, death by sin, we have that judgment because you are born with a sin problem. Your neighbors are born with a sin problem. Your children are born with a sin problem. Your coworkers are born with a sin problem. That's why Franklin Graham's coming to Flint. And on September 29th, he's going to get up there and say, God loves you. Even though you are a sinner, God loves you. And I got good news. Jesus Christ. Franklin, Franklin's going to get up and he's going to point to that one man. Jesus Christ. Because that's the only way out of our Adam side. The one man Adam. Jesus Christ. Sin is universal. Death is universal. Sin started with Adam, but it continues with us. Then the gift and the guilt. Guilt and gift. Here's another comparison. Mankind brought guilt. God brought the gift of Jesus Christ. He makes this very clear. And the gift is not like the guilt. The guilt is a terrible widespread and a terrible dangerous. It's for everyone. But the gift is wonderfully available for all, but wonderfully effective for only those who believe. Friends, this is the point of gospel urgency. Through Adam, all immediately became sinners. Anyone who sucks air for free is a sinner. However, God's gift was for all, but is only effective for those who believe. Therefore, we've got gospel urgency. We need to tell anybody who has breath about Jesus. Because anybody you talk to has the Adam sin problem, but they need Jesus' solution. It's beautiful how he's comparing and contrasting, but that is why we have gospel urgency. It goes on. So you've got sin and sickness. Everybody say that with me. Sin and sickness. You've got guilt and gift. Ready? Guilt and gift. Number three, we've got disobedient and obedient. Say it with me. Disobedient and obedient. Paul tells us that Adam chose sin, but Christ is righteousness. I wanted to use that to show you that. You catch that little, that little gift? Jesus didn't choose righteousness. He is righteousness. Just like you and I, we are sin from birth. Jesus is righteousness. So he he talks about obedience and disobedience. And then four, death and destiny. Say it with me. Death and destiny. He compares those two. He says that sin reigns in death. 
And death is a tragic result. From the time that Adam chose sin, death entered this world. You're like, wait a second. He didn't die automatically. No, but he started to die. He started to die. Because it was at that moment that sin entered the world, that, sick, that sickness of death was there. Disease, decay. Remember the punishment in the garden is that we don't live forever physically, but also farmer Ed, gardener Ed, what happens to your garden? You got problems. You got problems in the garden. Why? Because of stupid weeds. Weeds and bugs and worms. I was over at Janella's house. You know, Janella broke her hip. And so I'm trying to, trying to keep her pool. Funk, she loves her pool. So we're trying to keep her pool going. And I was over there, and we were chatting a little bit. And, and she kind of hobbles out. And she, first thing she says is, I can't get down to my tomatoes. Kill those worms. She says, get those worms. <laughs> she wanted them dead. Because she's got these beautiful tomatoes. She's talking about the heirloom tomatoes, these beautiful kind of breeds that she has there. And she just, kill those worms. Why do we have to do that? Adam. Everybody, that's, it's Adam. Adam's sin brought thorns and thistles and weeds. And not only that, cancer and decay and heart problems. All these things are a result of sin, sin and death. But then Paul does a beautiful thing there at the end. He starts comparing death with a destiny. And he tells us you can have eternal life. This earth is sin-cursed. Again, my theology of suffering. Cancer is a horrible thing. But God didn't bring cancer to your grandma. Adam, sin, death, decay, sickness, that's from sin. We, we, we always want to point a finger at somebody when the worst happens, when the diagnosis comes on mankind. And, you know, my dad... You might be watching this today. Mom and Dad love you. Um, my dad's starting to have episodes again. You know, encephalitis. You know, they thought they got it. I got my dad back. It was wonderful. I mean, Julie and I were there in Illinois when we went to see him, and he was in a convalescent home, and it took me 15 minutes to get him out of his bed and into a wheelchair to take him for a walk. And he had a hard time even communicating. We thought we'd lost him. But they, they, they found out what it was. They pumped him full of all the steroids. And, it really t and he's been good. He's been driving and doing and life. And then in the last month, he admitted he started having these episodes again. It's back. It's back. Well, see, that's hard for me to take. I don't want to lose my dad. I don't want to see him go back to where he was. But... I told my wife on the way home last night on a trip we had, I said, you know, eventually it's going to take him. Something's going to take him. He's, he's 80. He's not going to live forever, right? I, I think the Bible even tells you, you might get 70. You might get 70. Those of you over 70, you're living on free borrowed time. Have a great time with it. Enjoy it. But you're not guaranteed much more than that. Why? Death and sin. Sin and death. It's a fact. It's universal, matter of fact. So therefore, we are, we've got to be gospel urgent. And Paul does a, just a masterful job here comparing and contrasting. Adam sinned, Jesus righteousness. Adam brought death. Jesus brings life. And the beautiful thing is for those who believe, we have a hope of eternal life out of this sin-cursed world. Aren't we looking forward to that? that? That comparison of this world with that world? In this life, you will have trouble. Cancer is a reality. Every time I try to read a menu, I do stupid cursed eyes. I can't see. And, you know, the, and I'm starting to notice that my cool glasses that I use, they're not working as good as they used to. I'm going to have to get a bigger... Why? It's heading downhill. Everything's heading downhill physically. But the good news is we have a hope where there, there's going to be no more death, no more sorrow, no more decay, no more encephalitis attacking the brain lining and, and, and no more heart disease and, and no more insomnia, no more anxiety that keeps us from restful rest. No more of those stupid CPAP machines. <laughs> Aren't we an awful breed? I mean, we're just an awful result coming from Adam. And what, what's happened to us? They, they plugged us in like Darth Vader. 
I am your father. <laughs> it's all decay. So you, you need to do what you have to do here and now. Take care of yourselves. Get rest. Watch your heart. Eat less Twinkies. Yes, do all those things, but know this certain fact. Because sin is universal, death is universal. May you live to be 90 and enjoy it all the way up to your last day. But even then, the reality is, what's next? What Paul has done here in, in Romans 5 is a, a piece of art. Compare and contrast. So in Adam, so also in Christ. I have to ask you, the question is today, has grace reigned in your life? Has there been a time when you've asked God, please forgive me of my sinfulness, come into my life as Savior and Lord? If you've never done that, if you never asked Him to do that, it's as simple as a prayer. You can do it in your seat where you're at right now. Don't wait. Let grace reign where sin once reigned. See, that's my hope. My hope is that I'll spend eternity in heaven worshiping Jesus. My guitar strings won't break and I can hit the high notes. I can't wait for the day. I can't wait for a day where there's the, the, the curse of sin, what it's done to us. Our relationships are broken. It, it's so widespread. Friends, you, you, were, you were worried over the last three years about an epidemic of, of uh, what was that, COVID, remember? You know? Just think about, think about, we shut the whole world down. But look what sin has done. I don't know, some of you sneak through COVID without getting it. Who here never got COVID? bunch of turkeys. I had it at least twice. They only diagnosed it once, but I had it at least twice, maybe three times. I don't know. All of you all have been infected with sin. It's universal. Nobody skips that. You can't mask it away. You can't lock yourself in a basement away. It came from Adam. It's yours right now. And unless something intervenes, and the only thing that can intervene is for God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him shall not perish. That's the consequence of what we're living in. But have everlasting life. Is that your reality today? Let's pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I pray that in this room, eternal life, would be the gift through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. Lord, Deity, Christ, the Messiah. It's through Him, the only way. He is the door. He is the way. He is the ladder. He is the truth. He is the life. He is the one way to overcome the effects of Adam. One man Adam, one man Jesus Christ. God, I pray that the reality would be for everyone in this room today that they would know you as their personal Savior. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand with me as we look at the last slide. Stand with me. I'll read it. My sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Sin is powerful. Grace is more powerful. Did you see the Little League World Series? Did you see that little team from Tennessee? Did you see the t-shirts they made? Oh, they're in trouble. All the teachers are so mad at this little league team right now. Did you see the shirt? See, they missed three weeks. Tennessee started school a long time ago. They're three weeks. Uh, four weeks ago, Tennessee started school. And these little league boys have been playing baseball. And so the, the team made shirts. School is important. Baseball is importanter. <laughs> it's a great shirt, but the teachers hate it. Teachers are like, that's so wrong. Yeah, it is. That's why it's funny. The truth is, sin is powerful. But grace is powerfuler. Amen? Jesus is powerfuler. It might not be a word, but it is right. God bless you. Go in peace. Have a great rest of your holiday weekend.